If you're making a game in Godot like I am, uh, you're probably going to see tons and tons of tutorials and things like that on YouTube and the internet. What I try to do is give like kind of a more intermediate level of advice, not like super advanced, but someone who's maybe been coding in the engine for a year or two might look at a video like this and get something useful out of it. I haven't done a video in Godot in a long time, so I want to do one that's for the developers. I do believe that we are a community and the more that we help each other and the more that we help the community, um, you know, just the better it is for the ecosystem. So today I'm going to talk about five things that you should be doing in your Godot projects. For each of these examples, we're going to be looking at bushcraft survival and how I actually do that in my game. Okay, so point number one, uh, color code your folders. In other words, be organized. Ultimately, I think you can use whatever folder structure makes sense for you and your brain um, as long as you get organized about it. So for me, I have a bunch of different folders here, um, but generally all my assets come into this assets folder. The way this works is that all my 3D assets get their own folder and uh, the meshes, of course, the GLTF files, that comes into the folder along with all the textures. And then sometimes I use my pipeline, and then other times I actually use the, um, the feature to set mesh save paths. Um, this can be super good if you want to just link that mesh to a TRS file here and then incorporate that into a mesh instance 3D or even a multi-mesh instance uh, 3D. And then you can make changes in Blender and update the model and then just export it again and it'll automatically get updated. But generally I have my assets, uh, my globals, which I am gonna talk about in a second. So I'll just leave that one for now. I do use the concept of prefabs. Sometimes it helps when discussing with Unity developers because they, they use that term as well. And for me, a prefab is just anything that has like a collection of nodes or a collection of objects that follow, I would say, a pattern that I'm developing in the game. I think what you can do is eventually, once you get locked in on what this format is for your rigid bodies and where your, your areas go and things like that, then you can start developing out that um, structure and then do a refactor later. So that's my prefabs uh, folder. Then I have scenes and scenes is everything from where does the game actually start? In my case, I have this first node scene that actually does some smart like preloading things. For instance, if I find that a player is on, on an older version and I change the control scheme, then I actually want to delete their control mapping, um, which is unfortunate for them if they've mapped custom things. But if I've introduced new controls into the game during my play test, I don't want them to have their game crash because a control mapping doesn't exist. So you can do things like check to see if you know your um, save data path is good and then swap out some stuff if you need to. Um, that print statement probably shouldn't be there. All right, and then I have UI, which is all my themes and images and some things like that. Number two, use but don't abuse auto loads. This took me a while to figure out, uh, and I'm going to try to find a way to explain it that makes sense. Uh, for those of you who don't know, auto loads are here in Globals under this panel here. If you ask a pure programmer, they're not going to like like them. Um, it's the concept of like a singleton. You can kind of call them and access them from anywhere in your game, any node, any place in the scene tree. Um, but I think there are caveats, right? There are caveats to doing this. I'll give you a great example. Uh, is the Steamworks, or sorry, is the Steam add-on um, that you can get to, to talk to Steam and do stuff like that. Um, this makes perfect sense to be a auto load because you can call any of these functions. You can call them from anywhere in the code. If I want to do a set statistic, for instance, right? If I'm setting a statistic using the Steam Stats API, what you should consider is that your auto loads should be mostly just functions and you can have some data. But the thing you need to remember about auto loads is that as soon as your game loads, as soon as the scene tree loads for the first time, these are loaded as nodes at, at that root level and they persist through the entire game's lifetime. Um, so you have to be careful about thinking about what stuff goes into an auto load and what doesn't. I usually always create one that's called game. And I know it sounds vague and it sounds not useful. If I have game mechanics that I, that I have functions for and logic for, 
Um, I don't necessarily know where it fits in the whole structure yet. Put it in game, get yourself going, create some mechanics, and then you can kind of organize it and figure it out later. I have an inventory one that manages everything for the inventory, everything for the tooling system. The game environment handles all of the, like, wind uh, stats like how does the wind change with time how does the you know the sun rising and setting how does that affect the heat in the atmosphere all of those kind of variables are controlled from the game environment the control saver is a um is an auto load that basically helps me deal with everything to do with input mapping so this does bring me to point number three make sure you understand what things need to be loaded with the scene. This one is also something that I think just takes time to understand. Uh, we can kind of see the terrain here, right? And if you think about how the terrain works in my game, there's kind of two ways that I want to generate the terrain and possibly three. Right now on the title screen, so let me just boot that up. So this is the title screen and you can see that we've loaded the terrain here. I don't want this terrain to actually persist throughout the lifetime of the, the game. As soon as I jump into survival mode and I want to start up a new run here, I need to create a new terrain, right? That's the, whole, um, that's the whole point of it. So generally speaking, I don't want the terrain to exist as an auto load. And that's like a really high level design concept that you should be thinking about for every you know, different structure in your game. And it's the same for the forest. I don't want the forest to exist on an auto load because when I load in different levels, so the survival mode is like a level, then I need to load in a new terrain, a new forest, right? Um, so you have to think about those things on, on that level first. Same thing with the player character. Um, on my title screen, I don't have a player character, so I don't need to load that in on an auto load. I load it once I come into survival mode, and then this character comes in as a part of that whole level. Point number four, use ref counted. Um, ref counted are pretty lightweight objects. They're not as light as, say, a struct would be in C or C++, but they're pretty lightweight, and you don't have to manage that memory uh, manually. So I will show you an example of where I use it um, and kind of how it can be used. Um, So maybe this is not the best example, but it's it's not a horrible example. Um, let me try to minimize some code here so we can see what we're looking at. So I have this ref counted here. And by the way, when you, when you create a class inside another class using this kind of uh, notation, this is a ref counted by default. That's, that's how it works under, under the hood. Um, you can do things like I have my tutorial mode, which is a bunch of ref counted objects that exist in an array. So inside this array here, I have this um, STI, I can't even remember, yeah. What is it, survival tutorial item, okay? I wrote myself a comment here that was helpful. Um, so yeah, maybe comments too is a good idea. But STI is a little class that contains everything that each one of those little tutorial prompts needs. Um, you can create an initialization function where you can pass in some arguments. You can also have default arguments that makes initializing it really easy. And then you can have default values too. So what you're doing is you're like, putting the state of the, these whole objects together so you have to manage less of it. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, this is a giant array and the way the tutorial works is that it's gonna give you this message and this step is not gonna proceed until, uh, until this condition is met. So you can kind of use Godot lambdas as well to, um, to check to see if this function exists and then you can kind of keep all this together. Like I said, ref counted, they're not super, super lightweight, but they're lightweight enough for something that has like 34 elements, right? Anything that's not, you know, 10,000 elements, ref counted is fine. Um, and if it makes your code cleaner, if it makes your code more organized, you should do it. Couldn't talk about ref counted without talking about circular dependencies. Um, I haven't found much on this. I do see a couple issues on GitHub about it, but uh, you need to shield yourself from circular dependencies whenever you're dealing with methods uh, and data that use ref counted. And kind of to explain the problem, I guess, imagine we have this tool library. So inventory exists as an auto load, so I can access inventory from anywhere, right? So if I go to, you'll see inventories right here. And then tool library is a dictionary. So I could do something like inventory, tool library, you know, t dot hatchet. That's a, that's a valid thing I can do. But remember that 
it's going to reference an item that is created by that ref counted initialization. So this object gets initialized. So you have to be really careful. If this object contains um, anything from inventory in terms of like an object, like let's say I had another class here, class test class. I think I just had a typo there. So it's not throwing an issue right now, but when you go to run it, you might actually get a circular dependency because this depends on this. And maybe let's say if this depends on T was a tool lib item. Let's see, the engine doesn't always seem to catch it, right? Um, this is definitely a circular dependency. I can't create an instance of this. Like if I tried to create test class dot new, Yeah, I mean, the engine's not throwing any issue right now, but this is an, an enormous problem. When this class tries to initialize, it's going to try to create a tool lib item. And maybe what I need to do is try to create a tool lib item dot new. So this example, the engine is not throwing any issues, but when you go to try to run the game, it's not going to work um, because this guy depends on test class and then test class depends on this guy. So I forgot to mention that externally from the inventory singleton, you can sometimes get this circular dependency error that's thrown at runtime. And one of the ways to get around that is rather than access the data items in inventory directly, you can create a method that returns a reference to those data items. And for some reason that completely makes the issue go away. I'm not exactly sure why yet, but that was a way to shield yourself from that circular dependency. So anyways, that's my short, quick video on five things I think you should be doing in Godot at an intermediate level. If you haven't heard, I am working on a game called Bushcraft Survival. If you're into survival games, if you like The Long Dark, please go check it out on Steam. Um, giving it a wish list really helps out me as a developer. Any feedback you have on the game, I'm super receptive to. I really like engaging with the survival community uh, and seeing what people have to say about the game, what they want to see in the game. So anyways, that's it for now. I hope you enjoyed watching and I will catch you next time.